scientist with whom I went to high school, uh, who's at Duke now. She's a professor of medical genetics. It's going to be a, a look at, she's going to give a talk on dissecting the genetic mechanisms of sickle cell nephropathy. She does a lot of epidemiology, statistics, and genetics that isn't wet lab work. So it's, it's an opportunity for you to see a, science, a bit of science that doesn't necessarily involve a lab. It's also, you can start networking if you want to go to Duke for grad school. Uh, she's going to eat lunch with students on, on me, I'm in charge of Kennesaw. So if you want to have lunch with her after talk, talks at 1230 on Tuesday, Lunch will be from 1.30 to 2.30. Uh, drop me an email and I'll put you on the guest list. There'll be a little velvet thing there. The riffraff. You need to go Okay. I thought today we'd have some fun, as opposed to the rest of the semester, uh, by doing something I had originally intended to do, uh, but then cut out of the schedule because I didn't think I'd have time to do it. So thank the request for Monday I will fulfill next week during the review class. So we have a request for a little in-depth review of chapter 20, going over the highlights, and I'll, I'll wrap that up with sort of a survey of, of what I think is important for your course as well. I decided to turf that stuff to next week, and today talk about viruses and their role in human history. But before we do that, I thought we'd discuss a paper that you don't have that I just recently posted. So I know nobody's read it, but it's a very short paper, so I encourage you to go back and read it uh, before the final exam. I'm going to lead the, the class here for a few minutes as if you had never heard of it. And so we can try doing it in reverse. You're supposed to have read it, and we talk about it, we'll talk about it, and then we can read it. So at the beginning of the semester, in term, when I talked about why we should be interested in virology, mentioned a couple of things. One, basic science, understanding disease processes, and developing tools and therapeutics. And I mentioned something called the CRISPR-Cas genome editing system. By way of something that was current and hot research, somebody last Sorry, I missed. August or September, having re reported that using a, vir a bacterial-based defense against viral infections, developing a technology that allows rewriting of eukaryotic genomes, and they had done it in tissue culture. So they had purified this enzyme, designed a specific uh, nucleic acid sequence, and changed the base pair in cells and tissue culture. So just last week, a group at MIT has reported that they have cured a genetic disease in animals, in adult animals, for the very first time. So this is potentially really, really big news. And since it's, since it's in uh, Nature Biotechnology, it's a short paper, it's pretty digestible. So I bring it up as our paper of the week, uh, and hopefully leave you with an appreciation for practical, virological research. So this was a figure I showed you earlier in the semester where we have a bacteriophage attaching to a cell membrane. It injects its double-stranded DNA genome into the cell. Lots of bacteria have this CRISPR system. So CRISPR stands for um, Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeat. So it describes the sequence of nucleic acids. Bacteria have evolved a system whereby a protein called CAS, stands for CRISPR associated protein, recognizes the viral DNA. So this is not, this event of enzyme binding to DNA is not unlike restriction enzymes. So the protein has the ability to discriminate between viral DNA and its own DNA by things like methylation of the host DNA. That binding event leads to a uh, uh, endonuclease. endonuclease activity that breaks up the viral DNA into small sequences that are then incorporated into the host genome by the CRISPR protein such that we have a, a gene that is transcribed into an RNA called a CRNA for CRISPR RNA that consists of those palindromic regularly spaced repeats surrounded by 
a bit of viral DNA. So this is, this is a, a bacterial immune system. It's remembering viral DNA sequences such that this is broken up by another CRISPR-associated protein, binds to Cas3, well in this one, another Cas protein, Cas9 in the system that's described in the paper such that that little piece of now single-stranded RNA will hybridize incoming bacterial or viral DNA so that the cell can more quickly respond to another viral infection. So it's an immunological memory and response system to destroy viral DNA. The Cas9 protein is an endonuclease that's going to take an RNA hybrid, um, will hybridize to double stranded DNA. If you control, control the sequence of the RNA, you control what it hybridizes to. And Cas9 is an endonuclease that will go in, remove the host, and <coughs> polymerize the new sequence. In other words, you can edit the genome. So the researchers last fall, this fall, have used it to rewrite chromosomal DNA in eukaryotes. They chose uh, for this project, this is a demonstration of proof of concept, by the way. Can you cure a genetic disease using this system in animals? So they chose heredity. Hereditary tyrosinemia type 1, or HTI. It's not a rare disorder. It's an autosomal recessive disease, so if you have two bad copies. If you have two bad copies, you have the disorder. It's a single base substitution, G to A, in an enzyme called FAH. More on that in a second. About one in 100,000 people have it. Some populations, including Quebec, which are more inbred than other groups of people, it's about one in 13,000 people have it. So it's an inability. metabolize tyrosine. So here, here's the, uh, from the paper, the pathway for catabolism of tyrosine. So anabolism is biochemistry where you build things up. So pump steroids, you take anabolic steroids to build muscle. Catabolism is the other way, we're breaking things down. So you eat amino acids, you have proteins that need to be broken down, they need to be turned into, they're turned into free amino acids. And then your needs for various amino acids are different. So amino acid, biosynthetic and degradation pathways not, are, are complicated, but there's one, a pathway where phenylalanine becomes tyrosine. Tyrosine goes through uh, several reactions, so we have phenylalanine to tyrosine to some intermediates winding up in fumar fumaryl acetoacetate that's cleaved into fumarate acetoacetate. These are um, citric acid cycle intermediates or ketone body? Yes, can, can thank you. Uh, I'm trying not to get into to that. Uh, 
metabolizable byproducts of stress pathways that can be turned into glycolytic intermediates. So you can break waste tyrosine down to fuel molecules that can be used for respiration. Tyrosinemia type 1 is a defect in the fumarole acetoacetase enzyme or FAH. It results in an accumulation of well, the, the intermediates. That accumulation of intermediates is toxic to the liver, so we have an accumulation in the liver of toxicity, um, eventually resulting in death. So it, it has acute liver injury, among other things, causes loss, loss of weight in mice with it. So we have a mouse system, they're not doing this experiment with humans. There is a drug, NTBC, this is used in, in humans, uh, and it inhibits It inhibits this enzyme in a competitive fashion such that we don't have accumulation of the pro products, but we can shunt back to tyrosine. So the, the drug is given to people with the disease as a first-line defense. It's a bad drug. You can kind of tell that um, because it was originally developed as an herbicide. It's got a lot of side effects, including blindness. Take blindness over death. It also loses effectiveness, leading to the tyrosinemia effects anyway. Eventually, the ultimate treatment is liver transplant, but there are a lot of people who need livers. So this is a, a disease with a problem, or a disease with no with effective but not ideal treatments. Genetic, so not curable until last week. That mutation, by the way, that G to A mutation is at an exon-intron boundary and results in missing of an eighth, or exon number eight, so that the protein that's made is, is uh, not functional. So the researchers here designed a vector that expresses the Cas9 protein and an RNA, so it's a small guide RNA, so that's the, the sequence that contains the base they want to change. So, and then, well, so they <coughs> took the disease mouse model and then either control or experimental injected that plasmid with the gene and the, R, the gene for casting RNA on it, injected it in a tail mite, the tails of mice, so it's circulatory. They, this mouse is, has, has the base change, it's tyrosinemic. You keep them on the drug so that they can live and breed. So injections would be done, the drug would be withdrawn, and then they would measure whether it had worked by whether they get production of functional FAH. In the, in the liver. So, making a somewhat long story, well, short story, not as long as I was planning on. The A, a results in slipping of the splicing from 7 to 9, leaving out 8. If you change that to a G, you get 7, 8, and 9. So, the experiment is injecting mice, withdrawing the drug, and then monitoring their body weight here. So, just injecting either the DNA buffer or a protein not conjugated to the RNA, you get mice that <coughs> drop weight. So the black lines are the controls. And their, their protocol is such that when the mice lost 20% of their body weight, they were euthanized. So they get to, get to 0.8 and remove from the experiment and cure the mouse. They had three different oligonucleotides that were three different uh, sort of sliding windows on what that molecule in the CAS system was, 
FAH2 resulted in the mice indeed even gaining weight after withdrawal from the drug. I'm going to skip over that. They could take the last two effective ones, put them back on the drug, and they could find it. In liver, uh, they take the liver of a, this is a wild type mouse and stain for presence of, of functional FAH. They have a discriminatory stain. It looks like this. Here's the uh, disease mouse, no, no uh, treatment with the CRISPR Cas, and then the oligo coming back. We see not all of the cells, but patches of the cells getting expressing FAH2. Looking at reverse transcriptase PCR, wild type looks like that. The mutant is smaller, as you would expect, because we're missing an intron, an exon. So it's a slightly smaller base. So a slightly smaller molecule. And then the CRISPR Cas, all three of those DNA sequences they chose produced the RNA, of course, give us both species. So they've delivered the functional copy to the genome, and this is to show you that the larger uh, molecule in the electrophoresis has exon 8, the smaller one does not. This is, this is, is the um, different replicates, wild type mice, mutant mice, mutant mice that have had Several of their, or their hepatocytes rewritten to produce FH, so they're not getting 100% levels, which is commensurate with the histology. Not, so not, it's not totally effective on liver biopsies. I'm going to, well, actually, no, come back. So they did sequencing uh, of hepatocytes from the mice. Of course, the mutants have, I know you can't read this, but this is the, the mutants have an A in this position. They have a G here. The wild type down here, of course, is all G. Of that population of liver cells they pulled out, so you're looking at hepatocytes here, only some of them are rewritten commensurate with the histology, commensurate with the activity. Then over time, those hepatocytes actually grow and become more part of the liver than the ones that don't. So there is a functional in vivo selection as well. One potential problem, I'm really looking forward to you know, upgrading my own software with this sort of system, get better looking and thinner, is they do find an, incur uh, an incidence of indels, or insertions, or deletions, so that the CRISPR-Cas is making some mistakes, as you may well expect from a protein whose job is to rewrite DNA. And so we see some in the revertent popular, not revertent, in the edited population where there are deletions in the gene, and that could be bad. They get, but these are from mice that have lived through withdrawal of the drug. So I'm very excited. The, viral, the genome editing world is a buzz. This really is the first time a genetic disease has been cured in adults. And interestingly, if you, when, you, when you go look at the paper, you'll see a disclaimer The authors have a financial conflict of interest, and that's because there's already a company founded to commercialize this technology. This is, this is how fast, I'm amazed by how fast science moves. The original observations of these activities were about five years ago. We've now gone to a live animal model and a company, which I think has a great name for what it does, Editas Medicine. Um, they are unlocking the promising of genome editing and they're based, well, 
almost entirely on CRISPR Cas. There's another technology that doesn't work quite as well as we're trying to work. So, um, again, looking forward not to the carrying of the genetic disorders, although that'll be great. I'm looking to being thin. I'm well, looking forward to being thin, young, younger, and better looking by rewriting my own genome. <laughs> okay. So we're leading into our discussion of the book. Some of or half about half of you have read. If you haven't read the book, I encourage you to go do some reading this weekend about the great influencer because we're going to turn I'm going to turn the class over to you next Monday for a class length discussion of the great influenza book, the Spanish flu, and the impact of an, that pandemic on the 20th century World War I medicine microbiology, et cetera, everything that the book entails. So we'll see how that goes on Monday. But I did want to do something that's of interest to me and is perhaps outside of a, a standard virology course since we ended up on class sooner and decided to talk about it. And that's an examination of the role of viruses in human history. And I want to do this with a few episodes of counterfactual history. So my father is a historian. Um, he studies the American Civil War and goes around giving talks to groups of people who are interested in things. And invariably he gives his, he gives his talk and then in the Q&A period so he'll ask the question, what if something didn't happen and something else did happen? Of course you can't know the answer to it. His, his joke is, in his entire career he's known the answer to one counterfactual question because somebody, according to him at least, asked what if Braxton Bragg, the Confederate general, had the atomic bomb at Perryville? Said, I knew the answer instantly was we'd all be speaking German. <laughs> because if the Confederacy won the Civil War, there wouldn't have been a strong United States to resist Germany taking over Europe in World War I unless Germany would have come to dominate the globe. So, <laughs> well, they wouldn't have come to dominate the globe if we had the bomb. <laughs> and and <laughs> <excellent>. <laughs> we didn't have the bomb, the Confederates had the bomb. Okay, anyway, so it can be fun. I read a lot of history uh, on my own for my own amusement, uh, and it's useless, except for gaining a better appreciation of why things happened uh, the way they did. And so one, one of my favorite books uh, I would recommend if you're looking for something to read after you finish up The Great Influence in terms of a, a big think history book in, in both science, how to viruses, and uh, how human history um, is what it is. It, it's, a, it's 500 and some odd pages, but it's really, really interesting. Um, by a guy named Jared Diamond, there's the cover there. And it's a book-length examination, essentially, of one question. Why did some groups of humans develop technology and come to dominate others? And so we are going to look at a, a few episodes of viruses in history and ask what would have happened if what ha had happened didn't happen and something else happened instead. Oh, oh I forgot. Um, sorry, I tried to learn how to embed YouTube videos today. So I'm not the first to do this. So I'm going to start with this clip from one of my favorite TV shows. Where so this is the Big Bang Theory. I assume most of you are familiar with it. It's a show about physicists and how infantile they are even well into adulthood. Like most scientists. And so Sheldon here and his girlfriend have invented a board or a game called Counterfactual. So we're going to play Counterfactual. All right, I'm ready for my next question. In a world where rhinoceroses are domesticated pets, who wins the Second World War? <laughs> Uganda. Defend. Kenya rises to power on the export of rhinoceroses. A Central African power block is formed, colonizing North Africa and Europe. When war breaks out, no one can afford the luxury of a rhino. Kenya withers, Uganda triumphs. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. My turn. <laughs> In a world 
where a piano is a weapon, not a musical instrument, on what does Scott Joplin play the maple leaf rag? Tuned bayonets. Defend. Isn't it obvious? You're right, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was r reminded of that because I was looking at, at the book last night. Um, so, so the, the, the ten-second version of what the hypothesis is of why some groups developed technology and some other groups didn't comes down to, well, let, me, let me read a little preamble first. Um, so Jared Diamond is a physiologist. He studies bird evolution, or used to actually, he does this now study bird evolution, very frequently would go to Papua New Guinea, we talked about kurus, there's a type of kuru, to study birds, and spending decades in Papua New Guinea, he got to know the people and the, the culture and the history as well. And so his opening chapter of this book is him being asked by a New Guinean, why is it that, um, well, here's the, the question, why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it to New Guinea, but we black people had little cargo of our own? So the book starts, we all know that human history, or we all know that history is preceded by very, very differently for peoples from different parts of the globe. In, 13, in the 13,000 years since the end of the last ice age, some parts of the world developed literate industrial societies with metal tools, other parts developed only non-literate farming societies, and still others retained societies of hunter-gatherers with stone tools. Those historical inequalities have cast long shadows on the modern world because literate societies have metal to, with metal tools have conquered or exterminated the other societies. While th those differences constitute the most basic fact of world history, the reasons for them remain uncertain and controversial. So the boiling down the hypothesis of this book for purposes of the class, it's those groups of human who happen to be near easily domesticable species gained an upper hand that persists to this day. And so, uh, one of the examples is the domestication of wheat occurred in what is now Iraq and, and Iran. The geography of Asia and Europe is such that wheat spread from England to Japan within a couple of decades. And that, that growth of the crop allowed those humans to have specialized Whereas in the Americas, the axis of geog geography is north and south. And corn, beans, and squash being the domestical species that were domesticated in what is now Mexico, didn't reach Mississippi until shortly before Columbus. And so those uh, groups of humans that didn't have those domesticable species nearby because of accidents of biology and geography didn't because they had to devote much more effort merely to subsistence. And there, of course, there's a lot else to this theory, um, but, but that's it for this purpose. And, and then my, my favorite passage from the book, because I, I just like to envision it. In a discussion of sub-Saharan Africa, which one, thinking about this theory, might predict would have been one of the areas in which humans came to develop technology and, come, and then dominate the rest of the globe, because in sub-Saharan Africa, there's arable land, domestic, or it is an agricultural, that much of the land in sub-Saharan Africa is now um, highly productive agricultural land. And there are lots of species of large mammals that you can envision would be useful livestock. For example, the zebras. How are zebras different than horses? Stripes. How else? <laughs> that's, that's about it. Stripes, at least as far as I know never been domesticated. They've been tamed, but they're not, they're crappy. They're, they're, they're not livestock. So you didn't see groups of cavalry, we've never seen cavalry troops mounted on zebras. <laughs> <laughs> Elephants, tamed, used, never domesticated. Rhinoceroses. Um, it's a, here's a rhinoceros. So, so this discussion of, of domestication of animal species in sub-Saharan Africa, the author mentions that Hannibal enlisted African elephants in his war against Rome, um, Hannibal from Carthage in North Africa, 
but not, and, and the, those elephants are tamed, but not domesticated, not bred. None of these tamed animals, none of the tamed animals mentioned before, was actually domesticated. That is, selectively bred in captivity and genetically modified so as to become more useful to humans. Had Africa's rhinos and yuppos been domesticated and ridden, they would not have only fed armies, but also have provided an unstoppable cavalry to cut through the ranks of European horsemen. Rhino-mounted Bantu shock troops could have overthrown the Roman Empire. It never happened. I've always thought rhino-mounted Bantu shock troops would be a great name for a podcast. <laughs> so viruses play a role in this, of course. Because of the development of technology, we had urbanization. We've talked a little bit about uh, evolution of viruses, the role they played in human evolution. Remember our uh, retroviral elements is enhancers of parts of the brain, but it was the development of technology and agriculture and domestication of animal species that led to an increase in concentrations of humans living in one or ur urbanization. And that urbanization led to uh, endemic diseases in a way that hunter-gatherers simply had never been exposed to. So humans that developed technology also evolved, experienced, developed resistance to those diseases that evolved because of the way humans were living. So hunter-gatherers move from place to place. Farmers stay in one spot. And they are, so for example, their poop gets back into, it's, it's a shorter distance from tuchus to mouth, uh, if you live in a farming community than if you're a hunter-gatherer. So we see all sorts of diseases, including viral diseases, which we'll talk about, in groups that have technology, which of course led to a resistance, which has immense consequences for history. Chapter 1, <coughs> Episode 1 of Counterfactual, the Palestinian Group. So, Athens, fight Sparta in classical Greece, Athens, home of democracy, had actually become an, an empire of sorts in that other city-states around the Aegean and the Mediterranean paid tribute to Athens. There was something called the Delian League. Athens was coming to dominate another city-state, as we've seen 300 know. Uh, Sparta had a, a, a different outlook, a different way of life, and different strengths. They were both the large powers in classical Greece, and as, as such may be the case in all history, they came to clash because of larger forces. The war lasted from 431 to 404 BC. Final score, Sparta won after zero. Sparta won the war, destroyed the Athenian fleet, tore down their walls, led to the... About 30 years after, both Athens and Sparta had effectively collapsed. Rule number one, never get involved in land or nation. <laughs> this is an ancient, but that's Prince's right. So, Athens, led by Pericles, had uh, adopted a different strategy from Sparta. So if you look, if, if you go to Athens today, of course, it's a, it's a very large city. But the ancient city was not actually on the coast, but rather there was a port called Piraeus, and they had built walls unlike anything else in the Greek world so that they could get from the city to the port and back. Spartans had more numerous troops, uh, generally fiercer warriors. The Athenians were the effeminate democratic types, or sorry, not effeminate, defeat. Uh, democratic types didn't think they could beat the Spartans in a pitched infantry battle, and so Pericles could pers uh, persuaded the Athenians to adopt a defensive posture siege engines and such did not exist. They stayed inside their walls. And the Spartans repeatedly, in so the Peloponnesus is the peninsula here, this is Attica. By the way, that's why you have an attic today. Um, an arch architects took over the term uh, Attican for a pitched roof over a building, and so that area under the pitched roof is the Attica. So Attica is this area. The Spartans repeatedly invade the Athenians and surrounding people went inside their walls and let the Spartans wreak havoc in the countryside, but according to the way things were done, they've come do it and then go back. So repeated incursions into Attica, the Athenians didn't come out and fight them. That led to a concentration of people 
in a city. So this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Thucydides, the historian, wrote the first first-hand account of a um, disease outbreak recorded by somebody who was both a witness and a victim. So Thucydides survived. The crowding in the city, these are all, of course, um, Renaissance and later paintings, somebody imagining a bunch of people dying of a plague in Athens. Um, so Spartans were, were roaming the countryside, sacking things, people went inside the walls. Of a city of about 315,000, very large for the time, it's estimated somewhere around a third of the population died of a plague. The question is, what, what was this plague? Historians debate what it is, what it was, of course, bubonic plague, typhus, smallpox have all been postulated. Most think it was typhus, which of course is a bacterial disease. But here's, the, here's Thucydides himself describing it. It first began, it is said, in the parts of Ethiopia above Egypt, and thence descended into Egypt and Libya, Libya, and into most of the king's country. Suddenly falling upon Athens, it attacked the population in the Piraeus port, which was the occasion of their saying that the Peloponnesians had poisoned the reservoirs, there yet being no wells there. All speculation to its origin and causes um, oh, sorry. When, that's, that's him saying all that other people describe the origin of cause. I don't want to describe the symptoms. Uh, there was no ostensible cause, but people in good health were all of a sudden attacked by violent heats in the head and redness and inflammation in the eyes, the inward parts, such as the throat or tongue, becoming bloody and emitting an unnatural and fetid breath. These symptoms were followed by sneezing and hoarseness, after which the pain soon reached the chest producing a hard cough. When fixed in the stomach and upset it, the discharges of bile of every kind, named by physicians and soon, accompanied by very great, dis great distress, yada, 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 death. <laughs> There's a paper a few years back, um, 1996, it's a little opinion piece, proposing an alternate theory as to what the plague of Athens was. And namely Ebola or other viral hemorrhagic fever because um, by comparison to that passage from Thucydides, uh, a modern case definition of Ebola notes sudden onset, fever, headache, pharyngitis, followed by cough, vomiting, diarrhea, etc. Uh, case fatality rate of 50 to 90 percent. So these numbers are very rough. Given its origins, at least according to Thucydides, uh, it, it could have been Ebola. There's also an argument about translation from the Greek uh, of a word, lug, lug ex kine, I don't know how to say it otherwise, uh, which has been um, described as retching, vomiting, but implies also a hiccuping, which is consistent, at least according to this author, with Ebola. It's a matter of interest, right? Was it Ebola? Was it typhus? Who knows? A lot of people died. It weakened Athens to the point where perhaps had it not happened, what might have happened? And unfortunately, it's not a testable hypothesis. Why? Yeah. Well, then it was Ebola. It's not a testable hypothesis. I did ask it in the wrong order. And the samples left over. Why wouldn't there be samples left over? This was like, you know, two, two and a half thousand years ago. Uh-huh. We've got DNA older than that. What's Ebola? A virus. What kind of virus? It's <laughs> the Did you know that or are you just guessing? I think I did. <laughs> you can just guess because it's not testable because we don't have a sample. We don't have a sample because RNA viruses are unstable. And there would not, thus, it, there not being any permafrost around Athens, mm. you're not going to have somebody who died in order to get a sample the way we have with the Spanish flu. So, oh, So what if? What if Athens had won the Peloponnesian War? I mean, there's no Sparta nowadays, anyway. So it's hard to say. I'm sorry. There's not a Sparta nowadays, anyway, but there's still an Athens. All right, so that's a boring way to play counterfactual. <laughs> what, if, what if what happened didn't happen, but something else did? Everything would be the same. 
<laughs> largely that's probably right. We could still be in the Stone Age. Well, the, the idea would be, of course, Athens was where the flowering of Greek culture happened, and it was the Spartans who were the backwards Luddites who didn't. Christianity probably would have taken over. <coughs> the answer is Alexander the Great never would have come to power. Because of the destruction of Athens' fleet, they became militarily very weakened. The Spartans emerged. But within 30 years, the Thebans, led by my favorite Greek, Epaminondas, marched through a destroyed Spartan society, freeing all the... So Sparta existed uh, by virtue of a bunch of slaves on the Peloponnesus called Helots, freeing them um, and destroying Sparta. So the great powers of the city-states of Greece were very weakened, so that Alexander the Great's father, Philip II of Macedon, was able to conquer them and unite them in the Macedonian Empire, which Alexander the Great, who, by the way, this is, I don't like that he's called the Great, because he's a thug. <laughs> For no real reason in particular, went and conquered the Persian Empire, much of the known world, devastating many peoples and cultures uh, across Asia. It did have the effect of increasing Hellenization, spreading uh, Greek culture and hybridizing Persian and Greek cultures. You can talk a long time about um, that, the, the benefits and, and negatives of that, and allowed, so when his, his uh, af after Alexander, the, there was, for reasons, there's a power vacuum in the Indian subcontinent that allowed the rise of, a, of an empire that was a precursor to a united India. So Alexander the Great died at age 32, which people say is very young, but in that time actually wasn't that young. And considering his lifestyle, um, he did actually live quite a long time. But he, <laughs> he set out from Greece, conquered Egypt, crossed the Persian Empire and into the what is it, Afghanistan, what is now Pakistan and parts of India before turning back, returning to Babylon, at which point he uh, acquired an infect, some sort of febrile disease and died after a two week illness. He was a mess, right? He didn't set up any sort of government or uh, imperial system, but rather, and what you can't see on this map is, gave his buddies control of various areas called satrapies. And then after his death, they started fighting with one another, and it was, it was a giant wreck. I'm, I'm informing this with my modern opinions, like, it's not acceptable to ride over the next hill and kill your neighbor and take his stuff. That was a legitimate way to make a living. So there's a case, there are case reports uh, people do just for fun. So here's, here's, there's a case report written by a physician who examined the circumstances surrounding Alexander's death and came up with a speculative diagnosis. So this is the table from the paper with his medical history. Of this. Born 32 years of age, heavy drinking, frequent bathing, married to many wives, one son. Uh, Ten years before death, traveled widely. Unexplained fever five years previously, many penetrating chest wounds one, one year before death on June 10, 323 BC. So clinical symptoms, escalating fever associated with chills, excessive thirst, abdominal pain, weakness, uh, weakness prostration, intermittent periods of delirium, a flaccid paralysis, and then death. So this is all described by historians and people around Alexander who were literate. There's, of course, speculation as to the cause of death, uh, including poisoning. He pissed a lot of people off. A lot of people wanted to kill him. Uh, both infectious and non-infectious diseases. Interestingly, few poisons induce fever. Um, and it is known that his tutor, Aristotle, acquired arsenic for the purpose of killing Alexander. Mm -hmm. But they weren't in the same place. Uh, arsenic does not induce fever. They weren't in the same place, and apparently he never did, but nevertheless, there's an example documented. Some people who purportedly were. Just, you know, I understand wanting to kill your students. <laughs> um, most, 
most people tend to think it was some sort of uh, bacterial disease, but an epidemic diseases known in the area like the bubonic plague uh, were not described at the time of his death. So, for example, if there were no uh, deaths among his troops from pan or pandemic diseases. Influenza is possible, so the, this guy put Alexander's symptoms into forget, Gideon Global Infectious Disease Epidemiology Something Network. So you can put the symptoms in and then uh, people around the world will diagnose. 41.2% of the people who diagnosed said flu. Um, no others described. There's some other inconsistencies. This author in this case report speculated, posited, West Nile encephalitis. Unknown at the time, didn't emerge until 1937, but people wouldn't have known. Um, mosquitoes in Iraq have since uh, been shown to be West Nile vectors, and Plutarch, one of the historians, recorded there was erratic bird behavior and observable deaths outside the walls of Babylon at his time. So this is what the author is jumping on to say he died of, of encephalitis by West Nile. Viruses impacting history. What if Alexander the Great had not died of fever at age 32? Somebody just poisoned him. <laughs> yeah. He would have died two weeks later. Yeah. Yet yeah, again, yeah, terrible counterfactual history. Maybe he would have put him over to the other, you know, Western Europe instead of. So, know, speculating. Right. So he turned back because the, actually the Indian subcontinent may well have had a higher population than all of his territory combined. So militarily, that was probably undoable. But would he have invaded China? Would he have invaded Italy? Would Rome never have come to be an imperial power? Of course, Alexander being romanticized among many, including historians, uh, he wanted even wrote an alternate history proposing because his Greek empire would have uh, would have been maintained. There would have been a flowering of culture and science, eventually leading to the early invention of steam power. It's also worth noting that Alexander killed a lot of people in recognized cultures, and he continued to do that. Bad things went well. Smallpox in the New World. So coming back to our guns, germs, and steel thesis, why? So we have uh, the collision of Western Europeans and the native peoples of North America, or of the Americas, over a very brief time being very devastating to Native Americans. And a couple of examples. Uh, the Aztec Empire first experienced contact with uh, the Spaniards in the early 1500s. Hernan Cortes invaded and went to war with the Aztecs 1518 to 1520, leading to the fall of the Aztec Empire, the destruction of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, now known as Mexico City. So here's, here's somebody's rec a recreation of the population of Mexico in 1500s, above 35 million and a hundred years later, most of it happening within a couple of decades, being down to three million or less. Smallpox was not the only disease that Native Americans were susceptible to. Syphilis was another big one. Um, other infectious diseases killed perhaps 95% or more of the pre-Columbian population within a short time of contact with Europeans. Europeans were resistant to it. Why? Because they lived in cities and they were susceptible to pandemics and their population had developed a resistance to it. Another example is the uh, Incan Empire was felled uh, in a very brief time by Fernando Pizarro. This, this is a painting from the cover of the Guns, Germs, and Steel book. It's a very dramatic episode where Pizarro and a few dozen Spaniards, who of course had guns and armor and horses, walked into the middle of the Incan army that was tens of thousands strong, grabbed the Incan Empire at a hopa, took him prisoner. Uh, the story is more complicated than that. The Incas were having a civil war. At a hopa was um, had just he, he was in he was where he was and vulnerable to the Spanish because he had just uh, won a civil war. 
and Pizarro worked with other Incas to refine him as well, but the Incan population was also in a period of collapse, which may have been part of the tension that caused the Civil War, uh, leading to, to the destruction of cultures and the domination of the Western Hemisphere by Europeans in very short order. Another example from here at home is the decline of the Mississippian culture. Have you ever been to the Etowah Indian Mounds? So, I think I'll take my kids there. So there's a, a mound building culture that radiated out from, out from the Mississippi Delta, but came as far east as, as Georgia and up into uh, the Great Plains. This was the, so this was a culture that corn, beans, and squash were primary crops. They're very protein poor. A lot of uh, the efforts of the people in the culture were merely to grow food, didn't develop technology, but collapsed largely before ever having contact with Europeans due to the spread of smallpox and other infectious diseases from Mexico and the Caribbean islands that were occupied by the Europeans long before. Um, the, what is now the U.S.? Etowah uh, shows its last human activity about 1505, so 13 years after Columbus, perhaps before any European had reached that part of what is now Georgia. There's some evidence that I think it was DeSoto went through the area, but the, the disease killed out, killed the native long before, or even before military conflict ensued. An example of biological warfare. Smallpox in the French and Indian War. So in, there was a, a truly world war between France and England in the mid-18th uh, century, which in the U.S. is known as, the, or in North America, I guess, is known as the French and Indian War, which was fought along the frontier between the British colonies and the French colonies. It ended in... Uh, France losing and ceding the, its territory east of the Mississippi to Britain. But there was one, and one episode um, in what is now Pittsburgh, the siege of Fort Pitt, where the British commander, in, there's some debate about whether this actually occurred, but this is the story, um, took blankets from dead British soldiers and made sure they got distributed to the Indians who were allied with the French and besieging the British fort. Here's the quote, I'll try to inoculate the bastards with some blankets that may fall into their hands and take care not to get the disease myself. Um, you'll do well to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets. This is the reply from Lord Amherst, after whom Amherst College is named. Um, Tony Liberal Arts College just doesn't seem very liberal artsy to me. You'll do what well to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets as well as every other method that can serve to extirpate this extirpable race. This happened uh, during a period known as Pontiac's Rebellion. So Pontiac was the, was the Indian leader in what is now Michigan. It's where Pontiac, Michigan, he goes and one of the Pontiac cars there. Uh, estimated uh, during this period, it's a couple of years, 400,000 to 500,000 natives in that died of smallpox. Many of other ways to contract smallpox from contact, but this was a, a conscious effort, if it indeed happened, to use viruses as a, as a means of warfare that could have had devastating consequences to, to everyone. I find it interesting. The British, having um, the upper hand in negotiations for a peace treaty, gave the French the option they could either keep their American territories or Guadeloupe and Martinique, two tiny Caribbean islands. They chose the islands. You may have a guess as to why. Sugar cane? Yeah, they thought sugar was more valuable than the Mississippi Delta, or the, the Mississippi <laughs> drainage, or at least the part east of it. So, what if? French had won the French and Indian War because. Is he speaking things. French? I don't know. Really? There'd be more Indians around. I don't know if I've ever seen any. 
Um, there may certainly be more Indians in the eastern part of the United States. They didn't know it. All, all well, <coughs> there, there are more Native Americans now than there were at the time, so populations, at least with modern medicine, have done reasonably well. Let me end up our investigation into counterfactual history with uh, an introduction as to the, to the Spanish flu. Um, it'll be up to you guys to, to make class interesting. On Monday, uh, a global outbreak of, the Span of influenza, there's the H1N1 subtype, so remember these are the viral coproteins, um, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Strain typing is done by uh, which variant of those proteins the flu virus has and can rearrange quite easily. Global pandemic caused likely or caused because World War I was happening. There were lots of uh, movements of people. There were 500 million infections, somewhere uh, around 100, 100 million or fewer deaths over a very brief period of time. There were, there were three bursts of several weeks each where most people died. It may have emerged in Kansas. It was known as the Spanish flu. Um, because World War I going on at the time, the press was censored. Spain was the neutral country in terms of com combat in World War I, so they were the only ones with anything approaching a, a press that would talk about all the people dying of flu. The American papers didn't publish it because they didn't want the Germans thinking, well, Americans are all dying of flu, now is our chance. Um, and the Germans, who were hit sooner than the Allies, didn't want the Allies knowing that you know, nobody's really ready to fight in the trenches. Unlike other flus, it killed healthy young adults. So here's, here's a view of the, the dotted line is the flu uh, epidemics before. You see for death versus age. You see it's the elderly and the very, very young who are, who are most susceptible to flu. The 1918 flu, elderly and young still taking it on the chin, but a surge in young, healthy adults, um, not coincidentally around military age. It killed by, we now know, cytokine storm. Um, so it did, did kill by the mechanism of the flu, but many deaths were because of the overreaction of the immune system. So um, the, you can, when you read the book, you can read about the episode of the fever, the inflammatory response, and how that in itself caused deaths. So, what if the Spanish flu hadn't happened? It wouldn't have happened if World War I hadn't been going on because we wouldn't have had people transiting around so much. This has an impact in, in how we deal with impact in, uh, pandemics today because we have air travel going on even in time of peace. Here's a list of people who died of the Spanish flu. We might, well, we have been deprived, the author of Cyrano de Bergerac, passed away. What might we have had in terms of other plays about loser French dudes? <laughs> Here's a, a hockey player. Right? Would Canada have been even more triumphant in hockey had they had the services of Joe Hall? <laughs> Here's the leader of the Bolshevik party in Russia who died of the Spanish flu. Might he have been Lenin's successor? We might never have seen Stalin. Would that have been bad? Canada. Much worse. Um, Gene Roddenberry was born in 1921. What if his mother had died of the flu? No Star Trek. No Star Trek! <laughs> I don't even want to contemplate that. <laughs> Another impact of the flu. So Germans, uh, at the point where the, the pandemic that it was at a high point, were undergoing an offensive. The discussion, the great influenza, but their German communica communications among the German high command that they couldn't get supplies to the troops. The troops and cells were dropping like flies from flu. And that their, off their offensive stalled, like most offensives in World War I, but had the flu not been there, maybe that would have happened. That was before America really entered the war in any numbers. Um, the Central Powers, of which Germany was the 
the leader may have been hit by the pandemic sooner. That may have had military implications. Morbidity and mortality were higher in Germany than elsewhere, so they were hit worse. As you read in the book, the, the author goes quite a long way uh, in talking about this. Peace negotiations were affected. So Woodrow Wilson, the U.S. president, wanted, uh, did not want harsh reparations on the Germans. He, was ta he took ill during the peace conference. The author of the book speculates, you know, talk about this on Monday, speculated that he essentially gave away the farm to the Allied powers in Europe who wanted a very harsh terms for Germany. They succeeded in getting those, uh, which may have had some implications. So what if the Spanish flu had never occurred? And the answer here is clearly everything would still be the same. Would Hitler have remained a painter? Would we have a stable Germany that didn't suffer reparations and undergo hyperinflation and collapse leading to the rise, rise of uh, Nazism? What if World War I hadn't been going on? We never would have had the Spanish flu. Undoubtedly, it would not have been the pandemic it was. Travel between continents is not a very common thing unless you're moving around. Here. Communications would have been more open, and perhaps an outbreak would have been taken care of very quickly because people know what's going on elsewhere. Nowadays, when you're dealing with a pandemic, want to know where it is, isolate it. If, let's say, oh, you don't want to get sick, you wouldn't go there. For, for, we've talked about um, the current Ebola outbreak. Guess what? Nobody wants to go to that area. <laughs> well, so, yeah, so flights into the city in, in Guinea are virtually empty. The uh, epidemic is now being contained. I, I, I look for Recent, the most recent day is, I think, April 19, where they have total case numbers. The number of newly diagnosed cases is going down. Those prior reports I shared with you about cases in Mali and in two other countries, I can't think of what they, Liberia and one other country, turns out they were false alarms. So what we thought might be a very bad Ebola outbreak. You know, they were quarantining planes in Paris and Montreal. Like, likely never as serious as we thought, but in some ways it's better to overreact to the threat of a pandemic, at least when the cost is not flying uh, on a plane, than it is to underreact. But you can't over or underreact unless you have knowledge of what's going on. All right, maybe, maybe we'll have a final exam question. Give me your best virological counterfactual history scenario. Defend. <laughs> 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 Make worth like a hundred. <laughs> 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 <laughs>